Good morning, church. Yeah, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. We want to prepare our hearts, um, you know, to come into His presence, to allow the Holy Spirit to come and minister to each one of us, to liberate us to the place where we can just worship the Lord as a family, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. If you are here and you have burdens, worries, you know, just want to encourage you to just surrender it to the Lord. Allow His presence to come and fill us. Allow Him to be Lord of that situation. To be Lord of our hearts. Let's just allow the Spirit of God to come and just be in His presence. You can close your eyes. You can just settle in into the presence of God. Be conscious of His presence here this morning. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Just allow the rest of the Lord, of the Spirit to come over each one of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you will just cause our hearts to surrender. Cause our hearts to be at rest. We just welcome your presence. We need you, Holy Spirit. We want more of you in our lives. We want more of you in our homes. We want to focus upon you and to allow you to do that deep work in each of us. Thank you, Lord. That's right, just... Come to that place of His presence. Thank you, Lord. I'll settle our hearts, Lord. Let your peace just come upon our hearts right now. We want to worship you. We want to know more about you. We surrender our fears, anxieties, and to leave it at your feet, O oh God. You are the Prince of Peace. And we speak your peace over every heart this morning. to the Lord.
Just reach out we to the Lord. Let your presence, your presence fill us this morning. Whoa, King. We declare come, your kingdom come, your, your will, will be done, Lord. Hear us in heaven. Spirit come. Spirit of God for fresh Worship in the spirit this morning. Just worship the Lord. We're going to activate our faith to believe God for miracles. As we sing this song, a miracle is happening now. I want you to reach out wherever you are and say, God, I need this miracle. Yes, Lord. I need this miracle for my family. I need this miracle for my loved one. I need this miracle for myself. Let's sing that, that uh, chorus and we're just going to ask the Lord to bring about a breakthrough this morning. A miracle is happening now. That's right, just reach out, reach out to Him. Yeah. Hallelujah, thank you. Atmosphere is changing now. Amen. For the Spirit of the Lord is Just close your eyes. Declare that over your situation. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle. A miracle can happen now. That's right. Thank you, Lord. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Let's reach out to Him. The evidence is all around. Hallelujah. Spirit of the Let's declare Lord a miracle. A miracle is going to happen. Amen. A miracle can happen. Switch out. Now. Just believe. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Spirit of the Lord is here. Evidence is all around. Jesus is here. Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow, overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your love, your love.
of heaviness is broken in Jesus' name. Amen. We declare liberty in our hearts to worship Him, to worship the Lord. And we want to say, Lord God, You are worthy of all praise. Amen. You are worthy of all worship. So Lord God, even as we come into Your presence this morning, cause our hearts to be at rest in You. Amen. For You are faithful. Hallelujah. You are good. Hallelujah. And Lord, we surrender our lives. That Lord God, You will do something powerful and deep in our lives today. Move us forward. Move us to that place, Lord God, where we will shine for you. Amen. Even today, we declare your Lordship in this service. And we take authority and bind every spirit that hinders. We break every distractions Amen. in Jesus' name. Today, Amen. your name will be lifted up. Today, we choose to worship Hallelujah. the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Woo. You deserve the highest Hallelujah, praise. Lord, you are praise our you, God. Jesus. And Lord, we want to worship you. We want to praise you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's just give the Lord a big shout. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Amen. Can we just rise to our seats? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is here. Psalm 24 declares, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Amen. Amen. Let's just welcome the King of kings and the Lord of lords and declare, great is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord God Almighty. Great is the Lord God Almighty Great is the Lord on high The train of His robe fills the temple And we cry Glory to the risen King. Glory to the risen King. Glory to the Son. Jesus is His name. Glorious Son. Lift up your heads. Open the doors. Let the King of glory. Forever be our 
to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. And we just want to shout Hosanna. Hallelujah, Jesus. The King of glory. The King of glory. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Lord, even as we lift our worship to you this morning, God. Come on, church. Let's see. Let's see with our eyes of faith what God is going to do in our midst this morning. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire the whole ashes the whole ashes I see His love and Over all I sing, the people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Sing Hosanna, Hosanna. the generation that will rise up Lord and answer your call I see a generation rising up to take a place with selfless faith with selfless faith I see a near revival
this morning that God we just don't worship you with our songs and our voices hallelujah Jesus but that God we would give you our hearts all of it Lord that you would use it for your kingdom's cause this morning church we can look to God our living hope how great the chasm that lie between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What hope could fathom such boundless grace? The God of angels stepped down from glory to where my sin. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. Jesus 
risen. He's upon the throne. Hallelujah, Jesus. seated on the throne you are the king of kings and the lord of lords Amen. truly no one can compare with you lord god we want to thank you lord that you have died you have risen and you're seated on the throne Amen. even today lord god we just want to well up in worship before our king in every circumstance of our lives lord god you are still reigning Amen. you are still lord and we want to subject we want to submit to your lordship we want Amen. to submit to your kingship this morning father god we want to say lord we surrender amen let's surrender everything before his throne and lord as, as your children we come before you and say lord you are worthy amen you are worthy to receive the highest praise you are king you reign you are our God. Let's just commit our hearts to the Lord this day and say, Jesus, be enthroned in my heart. Be enthroned. If you are king, let me submit to your Lordship. Let me follow you. Let me be able to hear your voice. You know, God is reigning in our circumstance. Jesus is truly Lord. And we are able to rest in our King because He looks after us, He looks upon us, and He truly deserves the highest worship. 
Psalm 99 says, The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship Him at His footstool for He is holy. We want to sing again and just worship the Lord and worship Him from our hearts. Amen. Let Him be enthroned over our church and over our nation. Hallelujah. To the Lamb. Worship the Lord. Lift up our hands to Him. As we stand before you, God, let our hearts be filled with praise and thanksgiving as we behold the glory of the Lord in our midst. Amen. God, we just want to thank you. We want to worship you and lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you honor. Amen. And we thank you for who you are in our Hallelujah, midst. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah, you, Jesus. Lord. Praise you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness in our lives, over our nation, over, Lord God, our very families. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. As we prepare for Holy Communion, you can kindly take your seats. Let us remember what the Lord has done for us. He has given us life. He has given us healing, restoration. Yes, you can just open up your emblems right now. Thank you, Lord. I'm reading from Mark 8. Verses 34 to 38. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. Lord, as we 
take Holy Communion as a family. We want to thank you that you have called us to be your disciples. You have called us to carry on, carrying the cross and to follow after you. Forgive us for the times we may have failed you, for the times we have sinned against you by our disobedience, God. We come before you with reverential fear that you're coming for us, your disciples. You're coming for us who are willing to take up the cross and follow after you. So we thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your patience for us, your love for us, God. We give you thanks that you continue the, the work in our lives. In Mark 14, verse 22 says, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take it. This is my body. Let us take the bread together. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Let us take the cup together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We want to thank the Lord that when He died on the cross, He also gave us not only salvation, but a life of victory and healing. Amen. For those of us who are in need today, we want to stand with you, whether it's a family situation, a financial situation, or physical healing, or you're standing in proxy for your loved ones. Could you kindly rise to your feet? We want to uphold you and stand together with you, even those online. Just raise up your hands and your family members can lay hands on you. We want to look to the Lord for a, His healing touch upon your lives, for strengthening. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, together we just want to say, Lord, you are enthroned in each of our lives and we want to uphold, Lord God, our brothers and sisters, Lord. Even as they're going through this difficult situation, may you touch them right now. May you lift them up. May they know that you are for them, that you are with them, O oh God. Lord, may your healing flow in Jesus' name. May healing come forth in their hearts, in their wounds, over their minds, that, Lord, peace shall come upon their minds. Lord God, you are the Prince of Peace. We take every thought captive in obedience to you this morning. And we say, Lord God, be lifted up, be enthroned in our circumstance, be enthroned in that place of weariness, of tiredness, of sickness. Be enthroned because you are God who heals. So we declare right now, be healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be restored in the name of Jesus. And you're a God who provides. May you provide for each and every one. Open doors of opportunity. Lord, you will continue to provide for them, Lord. We thank you because you are faithful and you love each and every one of them. Lord God, may your touch, your healing touch be upon each one and those at home in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 We will now have our congregational prayer. We are praying for the nation's Royal Malaysia Police. The believers in the police force came together to pray in FGA on the 5th of April in conjunction with the annual Police Day. Let us together uphold the police force as they serve our nation faithfully. I'll read from Proverbs 21.15 When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation's Royal Malaysia Police. Help them to discharge their duties well 
and effectively uphold law and order in the face of many challenges. Enable them to maintain the values of justice, truth, integrity and professionalism. Sustain those who have faithfully served the public and this nation in an exemplary manner. Preserve as well your children who serve within the ranks of the Royal Malaysia Police. Anoint and empower them with your discernment and protection. May they know the reality of your presence as they carry out their responsibilities with due diligence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's just thank God for the police force and continue to uphold them. Amen. This morning, we will continue our worship through our giving. We can um, scan the QR code on the screen or do online transfers or write a check to Full Gospel Assembly, Burhat. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your blessings in each of our lives. We want to sow back into your kingdom so that your work will be enlarged, that people's lives will be blessed. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with this provision, God. Thank you for your enabling grace and your help. Bless the work of our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, we want to welcome all of you to the service and those who are online, a very warm welcome. Those of you who are new to our church, first time or second time to FGA, could you kindly rise to your feet? We want to specially welcome you. All right, could you wave or stand to your feet? Yes, thank you for standing. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming. All right. So um, we will give you an invitation card. Continue to stand. Yeah, just continue to stand. You can scan the QR code and leave some information with us and kindly join us at the hospitality lounge after the service. There is a special welcome back for you and we would like to have fellowship with you. All right? Okay, for those online, please uh, press the subscribe button so that you will also get um, the latest of what is happening in our church. So welcome to FGA. Right now, we want to um, welcome our speaker. We are so blessed to have uh, Pastor Derek Hong to share the word with us this morning. Pastor Do uh, Derek is with, uh, is with his wife. Um, Pastor Su uh, Sister Sulan, could you kindly rise to your feet? <laughs> Pastor Derek Hong uh, served 36 years in the Anglican denomination and was leading the Church of Our Saviour, Singapore. He's married to Sister Sulan and have two grown-up sons and three grandchildren. In 1978, the Holy Spirit began to move powerfully in revival among the church members. Following that, many cell groups and ministries related to healing and deliverance and counselling was raised. The attendance at services grew from 75 in 1976 to more than 4,000. Developments include the miraculous provision of a cinema for their worship in 1985. The church supports various ministries, missionaries, as well as releasing teams into cross-cultural outreaches and church planting all over Asia. Pastor Derek stepped down as senior pastor at the end of 2011. He serves as consultant to churches and currently pastors Good Gifts City Church. His mandate is to uphold the dimension of the supernatural and invest into the future leaders. And he also has written a book called God Wants to Heal. All right, it's a powerful book. You know, we can read about the many testimonies of how God had moved. And he truly has this gift of healing and deliverance. And I would encourage you to go to the foyer to get this book. There's only 30 copies so please go to the foyer to get a copy of his book. And um, so now let us welcome Pastor Derek Hong to share the word with us. Thank you, elders and uh, pastors of Full Gospel Assembly. It's such a great joy to be back. Uh, many of you will not know that my first visit 
was actually about 40 years ago. Some of you not even born yet. And the reason I came was not to preach. I came on a weekday because we have just, as you have heard from uh, Pastor just now, we have acquired a cinema uh, to be used as our worship center. And I came because FGA was also one of the, if not the first church in Malaysia to purchase a cinema. Am I correct? And I sneaked in here on a weekday to see how you converted a cinema into a church auditorium. So that was actually my first visit, a sneaky peek into your establishment to, to steal from you some ideas of how to turn a cinema into a worship center. So I'm very grateful that you set the pace for us and we were able to uh, take it uh, also in Singapore. Then the second time was I was uh, actually here to preach. I got to know the elders, uh, Dr. Ko and uh, Elder Ang. Uh, and, um, and you put me up in the guest house. Okay, it was, it was the first time I preached here. And I have to confess, I was eaten up by mosquitoes. <laughs> but, uh, okay, nobody knew about that. But today, you know, then the second time I came, I was put into uh, Brother Ang Chui Cheng, and uh, Sister Siu Ling, uh, Siu, Siu Qian's magnificent mansion. You know? So from, from almost like a mosquito-infested little room, I was put into a palace. All right? And today, my wife and I are so privileged. We had the royal welcome this time we are here. So I'm truly grateful and really excited to be back in FGA. And, uh, and since that first visit in ministry in FGA, I got to know your elders very well and some of the friends who hosted us whenever we come to Singapore. And actually, Dr. Ko was very, very kind and gracious. And, and he said, FGA has a standing invitation for you to come. You know? Every time uh, you went to KL, come and preach and, 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 and so on and so forth. And I had many, many opportunities to be in your wonderful church. So today, I'm really uh, thrilled to be back here again and grateful to have the opportunity to share with you the Word of God. I hope, uh, I'm not asking for more work, but I do enjoy being in KL, all the wonderful food, right? Although people are trying to compare Singapore and, 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 and KL now. Uh, so we, but you know, like, the grass is greener always, right? Across the fence. So we love to come to KL for your black noodles and uh, all, the, all the nice food that we, 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 we actually get stuffed with, all right? To be honest. As you can tell, right? It's already happening. So, Thank you once again for the privilege of being here. I have been uh, uh, asked by your elders to share something uh, quite significant, I guess, in, in, this, in your congregation. But let's begin by getting into the Word of God. We're going to read together from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Every time you see Scripture on the screen, it'd be great to speak it aloud. You know, the Word of God is meant to be spoken aloud. Actually, we have been trained to do things in a very quiet way. But actually, the Hebrew mind, okay, which has given us the scriptures, the Hebrew, Hebraic worldview is that we, everything is to be expressed. Okay? Expressed clearly, expressed exuberantly. With, and, and when you're worshipping, it's, it's to be done with gusto from your heart, from your spirit, and with your lips. Let's read from verse, uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1 verse 1 to 11. Let's, let me hear you together. Shall we go? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which causes disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside 
to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is, made, is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So once again, thank you for the privilege of being here. Your elders have, uh, I was informed in the communication, uh, that you, you are going to do a series uh, from the book of First Timothy, am I correct? I guess that has already been publicized. And, uh, and I've been assigned a job of starting a series on sermons dealing with the issue of uh, false teaching. And as you can see from the scripture we read together, false doctrine, false teaching has been around since the earliest days of the church. There have been heresies, there have been deviations, there have been distortions right from the beginning of Christianity. In the first century of the church, in the early church, many new churches were being formed, church planting, the church was growing exponentially, and established churches were learning to form communities, create community, and bring order. Please bear this in mind. All the first Christians in the early church, especially from the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, came out of very pagan and lawless practices. Okay, they, they, uh, if, you, if you do some of the reading of, uh, do some reading of the early uh, cultures in which the church was uh, involved in, uh, in some ways, not different from what it is today, but much more blatant, okay? Uh, uh, sexual practices of all kinds, speciality, uh, you know, temple prostitution. Uh, they were all over the place. And, and uh, there's a list of all of them that was read out earlier by, uh, in, our, in our reading just now. So the church was full of people who came out of such backgrounds. As you can understand, all right, because remember, the New Testament has not been written. Okay, the only, uh, only the Jews have the Old Testament. So the, only the Jewish Christians have some understanding of what is right and what is wrong according to the laws of God. All the new believers that have come in have no idea about what is right or wrong. They only know that there is a Savior and they, their sins need to be forgiven, but they have no understanding of what is right and wrong. Okay, they're, they're steeped into all kinds of superstition. They're bound by evil spirits. They have, uh, all uh, the, the culture of their time was very, um, very, very com com uh, compromised. Very, uh, a lot of promiscuity took place. Uh, the homosexuality was, was rampant. So they, they have no idea about So there's a lot of teaching that was absolutely essential that, that we take, have taken for granted today because we have the New Testament and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I trust you can understand, as you read the Bible, this is the background the apostles were addressing, the church was addressing. So false doctrines were there, and uh, they attacked the foundations of the, of the faith because people bring in their beliefs Right? They bring in their philosophies, they bring in their understanding of culture and society into the church. So the apostles had a lot of work, do you understand, to re-establish yeah, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is false. So that's why you know, the scriptures were so critical, the New Testament particularly was so critical. Together with the old, uh, they formed the, the, the basis of what we call today biblical faith. And of course, uh, it still continues and, 
and now there are newer ones that are with us today. But let me, let me begin with a provision, proviso as, even as we talk about the issue of uh, false doctrine. You know, the arena of false teaching actually is very vast. It's a, it's a big and complex, uh, the many complex issues surrounding, uh, relating to uh, false teaching. It, it will take many hours to work out, unravel the issues and the, and the topics that are involved so that if you want to have a, a grasp of it, it will take many hours. So while it's important to recognize what is wrong doctrine, a false teaching, actually my, my position is this, okay, that uh, indulge me, it's unwise to actually become too caught up by it such that we can lose sight, because we can lose sight of even more important matters related to living for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, an overemphasis, attention to false teaching can generate a climate of overcautiousness or even fear. People can become suspicious and critical of change, which then stifles creative or experimental approaches to ministry and mission. You know, the church is an organism. The church is not an organization. It's an organism. It needs to adapt. It needs to uh, grow it in health in order to be able to expand and improve itself. So there's a lot of creativity in the body of Christ. You know, as a pastor of many years, I, I'm amazed, that, that, and especially today, right, with new technology, technologies coming out, AI coming in. You know, there's so many opportunities and creative approaches to ministry that we need to be very open to. So let me uh, share with you, as a kind of a preamble, this phrase to keep in mind as we go forward in terms of even dealing with false teaching. And this, the phrase goes like this. Read together with me. It, it goes like this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Say that once again. Yeah, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Let me unpack that a little bit. What are the essentials? In the Christian faith, there are essentials. There are non-negotiables. Jesus Christ is our Savior, uh, our Healer, our Deliverer, our Returning King. Uh, there's no other God beside Him. We, we had a reading from uh, Mark chapter 8. Yeah? If we deny Him, He will deny us. If we are ashamed of Him and His words, He will be ashamed of us uh, when he, we stand before the Father. So there are, there are essentials. The work of the Holy Spirit, they are essential, non-negotiable. Yeah, full gospel, right? So non-essential, speaking in tongues, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, moving in, in signs and wonders, praying ministry to the sick, casting out the... Those are non-essentials. They are part and parcel of the full gospel. There must be unity. We must all agree to these values, right? A humility. Now, these are character issues, non-negotiable. Teachability, commitment. Those are, non -es those are essentials. They must, we all must agree. And if there's no unity, then there's not going to be power. You hear me? Amen? Right? Then in non-essentials, what are non-essentials? The color of the wall, right? <laughs> yeah? Uh, the, 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 the kind of, sometimes certain kinds, people like certain kinds of music, certain kinds of songs that, and to others. So, so different approaches to doing different things. These are non essential negotiable things. We can, we can talk about them. We can even argue about them without, the most important thing is, we come to the third part, yeah? There must be charity, love. In all things, whether we agree or disagree, our relationship is critical. That's a non negotiable We are brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter how much we disagree over something, if it's a non-essential thing, it's okay. We can agree to disagree, but remain as loving brothers and sisters in the Lord. We care deeply for one another. Amen? So this must be 
central to in all our dealings with one another in the church and in the body of Christ. So I've entitled the sermon today, True and False Teaching. I'm going to share something, I'm going to share more about uh, uh, true teaching and touch some, on some modern fallacies that are affecting the church today. There are, there are modern false teachings that are affecting the church today. But however, I believe the Bible actually is God's manual for us to live a happy, healthy, purposeful, and meaningful life here on earth. I think that's the central thrust of the Word of God. See, God created you and I for a purpose. Right? You are here because God has a purpose for you. And because He has created you, He loved you. If you ever made anything, yeah? He's actually very proud of you. Do you realize that? If you ever made anything, you're very proud of it, correct? How many of you made something, created something? How many ever bake a cake, <laughs> cook a meal? If anybody criticizes it, what do you feel? Very upset, right? <laughs> you, may not, you may not express it, but I'm so, I put so much effort to do this for you guys and you say this, you say that, you know, that kind of stuff. So God has made you. So He loves you. He is proud of you. And He's got a wonderful purpose for your life. The Scriptures is meant to reveal God's purpose as we relate to Him through the Word, uh, through the Holy Spirit, through the, the fellowship within the body of Christ. So the Bible actually is more meant for life. Okay, not so much in terms of religious teaching. It's not a religious book. It's a book for life, for successful living. And we have to have our assignments on earth to be done. When we complete our assignments, we die and join and go to join and rule with the Lord Jesus Christ forever in His kingdom. So, it's all about emphasis and balance. And this was Paul's approach to dealing even with the issues of false doctrine. He was his priority. You notice he instructed Timothy, the pastor of a very significant church in the city of Ephesus. And he charged them to command people to teach no other doctrine. Right? In other words, he's telling them, major, major on what is central, major on what is critical, yeah? major on what is clear from the Word of God. Avoid stuff that are speculative and unnecessarily controversial. That's what those uh, fables and endless genealogies are all about. I can talk more about them, but uh, it will take too much time. So Paul, the apostle, began his instructions about dealing with false teaching with a clear statement on what is true teaching, what is true doctrine. I'm going to share with you the marks of true teaching. There are three marks to true teaching, and they can be found on one verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Read with me. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and sincere faith. From this one verse, God gives us the purpose of His instructions. There are three essentials, three essential marks of true teaching. And we have to major on this. The first is love from a pure heart. I mentioned that earlier. The the ancient uh, English word charity, which is love. So what is central to the Christian faith and life? Four letters. L-O-V-E. Right? Love. Everything starts and ends with love. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God showed Come on, let me hear you. God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. It started with love. 
while we were still sinners. He didn't wait for us to improve ourselves. You know, there's this belief, God helps those who help themselves. There may be a little germ of truth there, but primarily, God initiates everything. He sends His love to you and to me. While we were in darkness, while we didn't even know Him, yeah, while we were struggling. So today, where you are, yeah, online, on site, if you are going through a difficult time, God showed His love for you by sending Christ to you. Right now, open your heart to Him. Then Luke chapter 10, verse 27. He answered and said, Jesus answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is central. This is fundamental. God loves us first, and we are learned to love Him and other people in return. It's all about love. We must major on that. And by the way, love is a verb. Love is not a feeling. <laughs> yeah, we often see, you know, a lot of the understanding of Christian virtues uh, actually is determined by, more by Hollywood no? than, than the, uh, and, and Bollywood sometimes also, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's not biblical. Because Hollywood tells us love is an emotion, it's feeling. Well, it includes that, but actually love is a verb. It's something that we do. It's desiring and doing the best for others. So how do I know I'm loving someone? When I desire the best for this person. Yeah? And I'm doing my best for this person. That's love. It's not talk. It's action. So it's love from a pure heart. But the trouble is our heart, <laughs> okay? Our heart has a problem. Not that you have a physical heart problem. There may be some of you here who need that healing today, okay? But actually, God sees the heart from another perspective. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In the Bible, the heart is the center, the center of all spiritual activity and operations of human life. The heart is not just your physical, it's not a physical organ in biblical uh, perspective. Uh, it, is, it is related to everything that drives us, in other words. It's a center of spiritual activity, the operations of human life. But in the natural, God says it's terribly wicked and contaminates our character. Salvation begins with a heart that is cleansed and changed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing else can change the human heart except the blood of Jesus, except the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must begin by understanding not just false doctrine coming from outside. We must understand false doctrine that's inside us. Because inside all of us, we have something that's desperately wicked, highly deceitful. So much so that we deceive ourselves more than other people. We believe in lies. We believe in the wrong things. We believe in stuff that has been propagated over us through, sometimes even through the formal educational systems. In Singapore, right? Very driven. Suicides are very high among young people because they are under pressure to perform all the time. So the lies, the, the heart is wicked. It contaminates. So to be able to love from a pure heart, we must come humbly before God regularly to confess our sinful desires our selfish motives and hidden agendas in all our relationships and dealings with others. And many of you would know there's one chapter in the whole Bible of, in 1 Corinthians 13 where there's a comprehensive teaching on the meaning and the practice of love. I commend, no, I charge you, right? Like Paul would say, to read it once a month and put into practice 
what God says there about love. Here's a song we can sing together. I think you will know this song. Shall we try? Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold, pure gold. Refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master. Ready to do your will. That must be the first thing we pursue. A heart that's purified. You know how gold, how precious gold is purified? Any of you know? Any goldsmiths here in the shop, <laughs> in, the, in town? Gold is purified by fire. They hit the, the gold. Don't worry about silver, it's too far down, right? <laughs> you hit the gold until it becomes molten. Yeah? Then you apply more and more heat until it liquefies. Then when that happens, when gold becomes liquid, all the impurities will float to the surface. So the goldsmith will scoop off the impurities and continue to heat that gold. And more and more impurities will float to the top. And he will keep scooping up carefully all the impurities and until he can see his reflection from the gold. Then the gold is purified. Can you see the relationship, what God does in our lives? Pressure, problems, challenges, even persecution, is meant to purify us. It seeks out, it, it causes the junk inside to come to the top. They say, when you are squeezed, what comes out? When pressure is put on you, what comes out? So are you gold or are you lemon? When you are lemon, what comes out? Sour. Uh, when you're gold, the dirt floats to the top and the master goldsmith scoops off until he sees his own reflection in you. That must be our first emphasis, even as we wrestle with issues of wrong things. That's the first mark of true teaching and theology. Love from a pure heart. The second mark of true teaching is good conscience. Now, same verse, 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and a, everybody say, good conscience and from sincere faith. Now, what is conscience? What is conscience? What is conscience? Can you feel conscience? No, right? In fact, when, when, when sometimes people who don't believe in God, you can ask them, what is consciousness? What is conscience? They're all these so-called scientists, they can't describe. These are things given by God. And the word conscience comes from the Greek word, synaidesis. You want to try and pronounce it? Huh? Synaidesis. It's Greek for conscience. And what it is, is a faculty that distinguishes between right and wrong. Moral is moral sensitivity. It's, in other words, something that God has put within every human being. Every human being has this. And in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, we read together, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts. 
either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. So conscience has this function. All right? It's kind of like a compass. It shows to us whether we're on the right track, whether something is right or wrong. Even though you may not know God. In fact, this passage in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 1, talks about people who never heard of the gospel, never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Right? Sometimes you ask the question, what about all those people, right? They never hear the gospel, then they die, what happened? Would God still send them to hell? Would God then be very unfair, right? That would be very unjust of God. But God tells us that everyone has been given a conscience and they can actually see from His creation, His handiwork. If you look at creation, you cannot help but realize there's been somebody who put all this together. Okay, the more you look at science, the more you realize how things have been strung together so precisely that if anything is slightly out of, out of uh, uh, alignment, the whole thing will collapse. So conscience is a gift from God. He put these facilities, this faculty into every human being so that we can have a sense of right and wrong, good and bad. However, the problem of conscience is it it's needs to be educated. Conscience needs to be taught, needs to be educated and trained correctly. And that's where God's law comes in. Yeah? God's law is, is, is God's definition, the Creator's definition of what is right and wrong. And, we, and He instructs in this word, His word, His truth instructs our conscience or else it cannot do the work because your conscience can be seared. Your conscience can be corrupted. You can be taught to believe the wrong things. Yeah? And then you, you begin to believe. You begin to lose that sense of right and wrong. In John chapter 8, verse 3 to 9, we have this powerful illustration of what the conscience, an educated conscience can do. Right? Read together with me, John 8, 3 to 9. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they may have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now, the people who brought this woman to Jesus were the religious leaders, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. It's a familiar account. And, and the, the religious leaders caught this woman, or the, I don't know, religious police, right? Caught this uh, woman in committing adultery. And they brought her to Jesus. Very interesting, they didn't bring the man. Do you notice that? How come only the woman is guilty? Eh? Right? So they brought this woman to Jesus and asked Jesus what he would do. What were they trying to do? They were trying to trap him. They are trying to snare him. Because if he said, according to the law, yeah, you're right, stone her, then it would show that he's no different from all of them. Right? What's so special about him? He also tell you to do what we would tell him to tell you to do, right? But if he let her go, then they would accuse him of breaking the law. You see? You know, so they tried to put him on the horns of a dilemma. But instead, Jesus said, let those among you who is without sin throw the first stone. And the Bible says, the word, they were, con they were convicted by their conscience and quietly slipped away. So the suspicion is, they probably were given the same thing. Hello? All right? Or other things, okay? <laughs> Which is related to... That means their, mind, their consciences have been educated. These were the religious leaders. 
right? So if they have followed their own conscience, this is what they did happen. They left. They did not do anything to this woman, knowing that they themselves were guilty of breaking the law of God. Well, perhaps they may should ever should also have been stoned, or other things done to them. They left the accused woman alone. So the conscience need to be educated, and when you when you when the conscience is educated with God's word, then it will do its work to protect us from what is wrong. So this is how conscience work. They were instructed in the law of Moses. So when Jesus says those are without sin, their conscience pricked them, and they were convicted of their own sin, and they were left. None of them can throw the stone. Now at this point, I need to talk about one serious false teaching. And this originated from Singapore. <laughs> so in some way, I kind of feel a bit responsible. I, 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 I didn't start this, all right? But uh, I feel a bit responsible because as an elder in Singapore, I need to voice this. Because this teaching is also related to our conscience. It affects our conscience. The teaching is popularly known as hyper-grace. Have you heard of it? I bet there are even churches here that uh, follow this. And it has become very popular. They have a massive theatre and shopping complex in Singapore, which is easily worth a billion Singapore dollars today. They have cash reserves of hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. So very successful outwardly. The emphasis of hyper-grace teaching emphasizes, of course, grace, health, and wealth. Now, don't misunderstand, grace is important. And perhaps we may have underestimated uh, the importance of, of grace. But the emphasis of one truth, almost to the exclusion of all other truths, leads to distortion. This is one of the roots, this is one of the roots of false teaching. When we emphasize one truth above all others, you will get distortion and serious errors. Now, I heard this from different people and I've done some checking to make sure I have not misunderstand or misunderstood the teaching. The te they teach you, you don't have to repent of sins after you become a Christian. As all your sins have been forgiven, past, present, and future. So all your future sins are forgiven. Anytime, in fact, anyone that tries to tell you you have sinned against God now, it's deemed as condemnation and need to be rejected. And furthermore, they say if under pressure... Now, this is very, very serious. If under pressure, you give up your faith in Jesus Christ, return to being whatever religion you're from before, Buddhist, Taoist, you know, Hindu, whatever, return to whatever religion you come from before, because now you're under pressure to renounce Jesus, and you say, okay, I renounce Jesus, you can still go to heaven. Now, I know this to be true, because many years ago, I heard this talk, and I and I, I, someone who came from that church came to my ground and, and told me about this. But I said, maybe, I didn't, maybe you didn't hear it in the context. Uh, maybe within the context, you may be talking about something else, right? You can have misunderstood this. Then somebody sent me a video clip where the pastor actually said this. It was in a talk show, some question and answer, and he actually mentioned it, under pressure, you know, you can. Then some, about a year ago, someone from that church came up to me for prayer. It was 20, it has been 20 years in their church. And after ministering to him, I asked him about this teaching. I said, is it true that your pastor actually teach that if you renounce Jesus under pressure, you can still go to heaven? He said, yes. So I said, you, you really heard that teacher? He said, yeah. So I'm, I'm confirming, all right, three, three, from three witnesses, so to speak, that this was actually taught. So they conveniently Ignore the words that we heard read earlier, right? From, Matthew, uh, from Mark chapter 8 or from Matthew chapter 10, 33, where it says, if we deny Him before men, He will deny us before the Father in heaven. So what it all boils down 
to this hyper grace teaching is this. Actually, it's a philosophy where there is no guilt. You go to the church, you never be told that you are a sinner, you need to repent. No guilt, no repentance, no commitment, no sacrifice. I call that easy believism. And that's why it's so popular. And many people don't realize that the practice of repentance is very important for the health of our conscience. See, when we confess to failure and sin once in a while, our conscience becomes trained, becomes sensitive to what is right and wrong. When we reject or neglect doing that, our conscience becomes dull because it's not exercised. We become dull and we become deceived and become prideful. The line between right and wrong, good and bad, true and false, becomes blurred. In fact, a pastor friend who ran a family counseling center shared this with me one time. He said, a woman from this church came to his center to seek help about her marriage. She said that her husband was, she thinks that he's unfaithful. And in the course of counseling, a long story short, she began to disclose that even though her husband was being unfaithful, she too was starting a relationship with another man. Friend, the pastor said to her, even though your husband is unfaithful, you cannot do the same. It's wrong. Immediately, this woman stood up, pointed her finger at my pastor friend and said, you are condemning me and stormed out of the center. The worst thing that just came out from this church and it prompted me to write a piece on my Facebook page on September the 7th, 2023, they hosted the largest drag show, the largest drag show on earth. It's called RuPaul. See, true teaching produces a good conscience. You're sensitive to what is right and wrong, good or bad, true or false. First, in yourself. So it, it creates a humility, a teachability that we all need. And to be able then from that to be able to speak out at the right time. False teaching corrupts your moral compass. You lose your sense of right and wrong. Let me share with you now an example of a good conscience. One day, after ministry in KL, I was put on a plane back and my host upgraded me to first class. So very nice, yeah? As I sat down, another passenger came and sat beside me and said, hello, pastor. I was shocked. I said, I said oh no, they're going to go back to church and tell me that, tell me everybody I've traveled first class. <laughs> Although, I think nothing wrong, lah, okay? Because, but oh, that was kind of me, all right? So anyway, we got to talking, and I got to know this brother. And he was a, the country manager in Singapore of one of the largest financial institutions. And we became good friends. Yeah? I, he would say, actually, I'm in your church. But I didn't know him at all, right? So we, over the plane, we got acquainted, we got to know each other. And uh, we, then we have several sessions where he shared with me, began to share with me some of the struggles he faced, being the, uh, the, 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 the Chinese, okay, in an in a, in a environment in Singapore, a Malaysian in, in Singapore. And uh, soon after that, a couple of years later, the, the financial crisis hit the world. And he said that the, the directors of this institution, this financial institution, uh, called him up. He came back to KL and he was given very clear directions. You know what, you know what corporations tend to do? Those of you in the marketplace would, 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 can tell me whether I'm right or wrong. He said that the board called him together and said that, okay, this, we are hitting a financial crisis uh, because it's going to affect our bottom line. I want you to cut staff by 20%. In Singapore, 20%. Now, this is what corporates do, right? They cut staff, overheads go down, 
profits seem to be better, then what happened? They declare a nicer bonus and dividend for themselves. So he was instructed to do this, and he shared with me and started praying. I had the a, a privilege of visiting his office. We prayed together. He said, I got up at 4 a.m., started praying and seeking God. What should I do? And the Lord spoke to him. So the, at the next board meeting, they say, okay, um, Mr. So-and-so, what is your plan to cut staff by 20%? He turned to the chairman and said, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot do it. Now, you know what corporations are right, right? right? If you can't do it, we just find someone else who would, right? Yes or no? Is that how the world works? Yeah? All the, all the corporate people can tell me, not your heads. So he was putting his own career on the line, knowing that this will happen, and he was ready for it. And they say, why? He says, sir, there are three reasons why I can't do this. Number one, all my staff are fully engaged. I can't spare. All right? They're all completely fully engaged in their professional work. Number two, this division in Singapore is making the most profits internationally. Of all the, all the branches, we are the best producers. We're putting in a good ROI for the institution, for the investors. And said, number three, these people have families, they have children to feed. And then he waited for the axe to fall. The chairman turned to him and said, you are right. And he kept his job. And the bank continued to prosper <laughs> under his leadership. But can you imagine when word of this leaked out to the staff? Here is a Christian who risked his career for me. It's the fruit of a good conscience. So that's the power of conscience. When you are, your conscience is trained by the Word of God, you stand for truth. You stand for justice. You stand even though you may risk losing everything. The third mark of true teaching. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Sincere. What is sincere? I hope you understand what faith is. We'll take another sermon, to, uh, two, three sermons to preach about faith. But what, is, what, is, what does it mean to be sincere? All right? Sincere comes again from another Greek word. Okay, you may want to... I know a little Greek, lah. Okay, he runs a cafe down the street where I live. Okay, yeah. And is, can you pronounce this with me? Anupokritos. Okay, anupokritos. And you get this phrase there, kritos, hypocrite, <laughs> uh, hypocrite. <laughs> so sincere means to be unfeigned, genuine, without hypocrisy. The word sincere also has Latin roots. And it comes from two Latin words, uh, sine, which is without, and sera, which is actually wax. Isn't that interesting? In the old days, craftsmen, yeah, designers, uh, especially builders, they would cover imperfections in stone because they built a lot of things in stone in the old days with wax to cover up or... or, or, or uh, Statues that they make, all right, uh, idols that they made, uh, that, that have maybe fine cracks. What they do is they cover it with wax so you cannot see the cracks. They sell this as antiques. Even today, I was told, uh, antique dealers, they would wax the, the fine lines of uh, cracks that may be in the, in, the, in the things that they are selling. So it's kind of unscrupulous practice yeah, to hide 
cracks, to hide scratches in wood and stone, uh, maybe even in, uh, in some kind of jewel, uh, jewelry, metal and all that, with wax. And either, another idea about the origin of sincere is actually more ominous. Okay, it, it has to do with cement, uh, concrete. When they were building buildings with, uh, with stone, just cement was very expensive in the old days. This is what they used wax. Okay, there are stories of unprincipled bricklayers and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, builders who sometimes employ wax instead of cement to join stones together. So you can imagine, right, when the wax melts, <laughs> the, the stones or the bricks would shift and the building would collapse. Okay? So when you say something is sine sera, sincere, it means without wax, it's an important guarantee of a good product. So our faith must be sine sera. No covering up of fine cracks. Yeah? No pretense. To be sincere is to mean what we say and say what we mean. Uh, to follow up with our promises and commitments. To walk the talk. To practice what we preach. How many of you know people who have been turned away from church and Christ by Christians who are insincere? How many of you know? Yeah. If we are careful, maybe we can even think about, have I turned anybody away from Christ, from church, by some insincerity in my dealings with people? You know, we can be very religious in church. We can lift our hands, praise and worship the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. But what counts is what are we like when we're back in our homes, when we're back in our places of work, when we are in the marketplace. Many Christians cover up their faults and insecurities with religious talk. Some of them are under the delusion that they are special in God's eyes. In verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1, Paul says that there are people who want to be known as teachers of the law. They want to be recognized. And that's a craving for human recognition and status. In fact, one of the roots of false teaching comes out of this need, this craving to be known as somebody special. But their preaching and their behavior doesn't match up. I want you to welcome uh, two other persons who are with me today. My, my own young, my younger sister, Doris, and uh, my, our goddaughter, uh, Pamela. Maybe you, the two of you can just stand. Because I'm going to tell a story about Pamela's sister, okay? Pamela has a younger sister. And uh, she was invited uh, together to a certain church in Singapore. Okay, I'm only talking about churches in Singapore, huh? And they, they, they went along, and in their service, it was a very big church, and in their service, during the offering time, this was in those days, they actually passed around a credit card swiper. Maybe you want to practice that. No money, never mind. <laughs> this was in the pre-digital days. Huh? So, of course, the people were, I mean, the, and she's not a Christian, all right? She's not yet a Christian. And she said, she, of course, was a bit shocked. I think, I think Pamela was also a bit shocked by that. But somehow or other, they get invited after the service to the cell group and they actually went, the sister went to the cell group. And in the cell group, they also collect tithes and offerings. And they, and they, and they not only collect tithes, they actually get people to fill up a, a form, a little piece of paper, how much they're going to give to the church. Right? Even though she's not a Christian, she's asked to fill this up now. For some reason, she went along, I guess the pressure was there, right? Everyone was doing. So she wrote a number and passed it back to the group leader. And the group leader, everybody had then to disclose what they give, what they're offering to the church. And so Pamela's sister showed 
uh, the, the leader took out Pamela's phone, and actually she go through every, this lady, leader go through everyone, and says, what do you do as a, uh, uh, in your work? And she said, I'm an air stewardess. And the leader turned to her and said, if you're an air stewardess, you should be earning more than this, right? From that day onwards, Pamela's sister never stepped into another church again. I had the privilege of trying to minister to her. My wife and I, we prayed for her. And, she actually, and then after that, she actually said, she said, actually, God is real. So I said, if God is real, why not come back? Come back to church. Try following Jesus again. And you know what she said? She said, Pastor, I know God is real. But Christians are so fake. It was like a knife to my heart. Sincere faith. May I tell you how I like to be known and remembered? You know, I've been given some titles by certain people. They're flattering, they're humbling. But this is how I see myself. An ordinary guy, just an ordinary guy, loved and used by Almighty God to do extraordinary things. Let's apply this. And let me close now. So the three essentials, love from a pure heart. Yeah? Secondly, secondly, good conscience. Three, sincere faith. We must major in this. But let me close. Before I became a pastor, one of my jobs, I had a few jobs before I became a pastor, was working in a bank. In the old days of banking, most transactions involve the handling of money, right? unlike today. And staff has to deal with a lot of hard cash, over the counter, yeah, over tables and all that. And many of us have to be trained to be able to distinguish between genuine currency and counterfeit money, especially the United States dollar. <laughs> no, they, they don't, they don't uh, counterfeit rupiah, okay? <laughs> and uh, the printing of money, therefore, is a highly complex exercise. Uh, governments must protect the currency from being counterfeited. So to, en to enhance the authenticity of dollar bills, many security features are incorporated into the design. Now let me just run through a little bit with you just for fun. Yeah? The first one is what we call a watermark. Yeah? Watermarks are images, patterns embedded into paper in the process. They are visible how to vi ultraviolet light, help to verify the authenticity. Then there's security threads. Yeah, uh, watermarks, security threads, at the same time, I just run through them. Uh. Then color shifting ink, you know, uh, the, 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 the denomination number, the, 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 the color can shift when you, when, when you put it under different kinds, right? Then micro printing, right? Text, tiny text or numbers placed into various parts of the bill. So it's intricate designs. Then something called integral printing. It's a method that creates raised ink on the surface of the bill. This gives you a distinct texture, hard to replicate. Then serial numbers, of course, yeah? Uh, each bill has a unique serial number. Checking the serial number against databases will validate whether it's a, a, a genuine uh, a dollar uh, bill or not. Then number seven is um, what is called a, a fine line printing, uh, intricate lines and patterns. So when they train us, uh, cashiers to detect false and counterfeit money, this is what they do. They keep them in a room for hours just counting the real money. They never touch the false stuff. They handle and feel the real money. And after uh, some practice, the moment they touch a counterfeit bill, they know. 
Are you getting the picture? Uh, this is an illustration of how we can detect false teaching. We must not spend too much time trying to unravel that, what false teaching is, although we need to be aware of what they are. Instead, we were spending more time, much more time, in practicing true teaching. Are you loving God and others from a pure heart? Do I have a good and healthy conscience that distinguishes right and wrong in my life? Is your faith sincere and impacting the lives of others? Can people, especially non-Christians, respect you and say you are trustworthy? Today, it's even easier to check on authenticity of money, right? They have what is called ultraviolet, right? The moment the, these lamps they shine on the, the bill, they can highly, they can distinguish and hide that may be missing or incorrect. So the ultraviolet light is the Word of God for me. Yeah, it's the, the Holy Spirit within me. And Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, He will lead us into all truth. So if you feel the Holy Spirit, you are, you are applying the Word of God in your life, you can scan with your experience truth and distinguish it from error. So let's close with the marks of true teaching. Number one, can you remember? Number one, love from a pure heart. Number two, good conscience. And number three, sincere faith. Let's stand and pray together. Let's open our hearts to the Lord. I trust that the searchlight of the Word of God, this ultra highly sensitive light, as it shines into our hearts, is revealing cracks, the fine lines of character deficiency and fault. And together, let's come before the Lord. You know, this phrase, Christians are so fake, never left me. It bugs me. I don't know about you. It just troubles me. God, have mercy on us. To be called fake, such an indictment. So let's pray that God would fill us with His love. First of all, let's experience, if you're not yet a Christian, you need to experience God's love today. I'd love to be able to pray for you to come to know Jesus. And as a pastor of church, I ask you to forgive us, Christians, maybe even some of us pastors who have hurt you, let you down, and given you this fake picture of what it means to follow Jesus. Hypocrisy in the church. Lord, we ask you to have mercy on us. Forgive us, God. Cleanse us from our sin. Purify my heart like never before in these critical days where truth and error, good and bad, right and wrong, are so confused and conflicted. Holy Spirit, Let the fruit of humility be prominent in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. So if you do not know Jesus and you want to give your heart and your life to Jesus today, can, I, can you put up your hand? I want to pray for you. Is there anyone here who would like to give his life to Jesus? Just put your hand up quickly. I want to pray with you. This is the most important thing you can ever do. Thank 
you, Jesus. It's okay if you're all Christians here, but maybe if, uh, at the end of the service, you can come out to one of the elders or to me if you still want prayer. Let us now all pray together. Lord, give us this desire. Give us a new yearning to practice true doctrine, love from a pure heart, conscience, trained, educated by your word, and a faith that counts, not just for eternity, but for now, every day in my life. Lord, I want to bless Full Gospel Assembly today that you will bring back that spirit of revival that has first been the cornerstone of this ministry. The wonderful, overwhelming presence of your Holy Spirit in healing, deliverance, setting men and women free, growing them in the truth of the Word of God to become powerful servants of Almighty God. So the Lord strengthen you. Open up the portals of heaven, the supernatural. Rain down upon you revelation and bring incredible, magnificent manifestations of the Holy Spirit that will impact not just, just this church, but this nation in the days ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before we close, I think we all know the song, Refiner's Fire. Let us sing this song, Refiner's Fire, before we close with the benediction. Glorify my heart let me be as gold and precious silver purify my heart let me be as gold Yes, Lord. God, we thank you. Thank you for thy word, Father, that, Lord, 
is so clear unto each and every one of us, Father. That God, we should not be caught up, Father. Lord, in overindulging between Father, true and false teaching, that we get led astray, Father. Lord, for the essentials, Father, let us come together in unity, Father. In the non-essential, Father, let there be liberty, Father. And in all things, Father, let there be charity, Father. And Lord, refine us, Father, that God bring us that, Lord, we have a pure heart to love, a good conscience, Father, Lord, to do thy will, Father. And Lord, most of all, Father, a sincere faith, Father, that God, we will not put people away, Father, but to draw all men unto you, Father. Let our life, Father, Lord, be a life of love, good conscience, and of sincere faith, Father. Lead us in this walk, Father. Fill us afresh anew this morning with thy Holy Spirit, Father. Empower us, Father, through the power of thy Holy Spirit to walk, Father, in sincere faith, Father. For we know that, Lord, in our body we are weak, in our mind we are weak, but in you, O God, we are strong. In you, O Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Father. You can, Lord, mold and shape us, Lord, as a potter, Lord, mold the clay into a refined pottery, Father, fit for your use. You are the refiner. Refine us into pure gold for your glory, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you once again, Father, for thy word unto us this morning. As you dismiss us now, Father, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Bless us and keep us, O God. Make thy face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Turn thy face to us and grant us thy peace as we go forth. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, O God, thy love and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us as we go forth now. This we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, all of you, for coming. God bless you. Thank you for those online. Anyone who needs prayer, please come forward. The elders, the pastors are here to pray with you. And if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, do come forth. We would like to lead you to know Jesus Christ. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, worship team.